All right. Welcome everyone to the tonight's great decisions. And I hate to make you cry, but this is the last great decisions of the 2022 series. And I must really thank the Fredrickson Library and Jessica Nuponen for their support of this very, very important event in our community. Look, we need to know what's going on in the world. We need to have people come who are authorities and who we can trust with the information they're providing. And we make that happen in our region, in the Harrisburg area. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about a most important topic that I don't think a lot of people are aware of. I wasn't even aware of the Quad Alliance. And I try to stay up on everything. And we are delighted to have with us Dr. Carol Evans, an acknowledged expert on these topics and on, I think, uh, international military issues over just uh, 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 all, all around. She is uh, can, can really give us some deep insights into this. But before we get started, I do want to remind you that we have several events coming up. Tomorrow night, we'll be with the Red Rose Foundation at the Civic Club uh, starting around, I think, six o'clock for an iftar. And if you don't know what that is, you're missing something, but that is open to the public. The information is on our website. And on Tuesday, we will be hosting uh, Germany's Consul General to the United States, David Gill, who's coming, uh, actually will provide some insights on what's going on in Europe with regard to uh, Germany's uh, help for Ukrainian refugees and just what's going on in general with Russia's invasion. But he'll also talk about how Pennsylvania can help, can help Europe, can help Ukraine, and can help Germany. So if you're interested in that, check out our website and uh, there will be information there or uh, email us at wachharrisburg at gmail.com. Just wacharrisburg at gmail.com. So with that, I'm going to once again thank the Fredrickson Library and Jessica Nuponen and all of those folks at the library, their patrons who are joining us here, as well as on Facebook and of course our associates. So right now, I think that what we will do is get ready to watch the video. I will come back and give a fuller uh, intro uh, uh, for Dr. Carol Evans, and then she will have the floor. So with that, Zach, who's our intern from Lebanon Valley College, Zachary Reed, would you please show the video? Decisions 2022. Today we tackle topic number six, the Quad Alliance. One week ago, we looked at Myanmar and ASEAN, a regional alliance. The Quad Alliance is significantly broader and involves more significant powers. This graph shows us the four countries involved in the Quad Alliance, the United States, Japan, India, and Australia. Three main considerations before we consider U.S. foreign policy options. We first address the issue of the Quad Alliance, exactly what it is and it is intended for. We consider strategic alliances in general and then look at America's pivot towards Asia. We start with the Quad Alliance. Returning to that earlier graph, these four countries forming an alliance with a very clear target which is the People's Republic of China. And as China continuously makes claims to the South China Sea, the role of the Quad Alliance could be enhanced. China's military spending, as you can see from this graph, has escalated dramatically over the course of the past two decades, reaching levels that are almost unparalleled in world politics. Of course, the United States remains the dominant military spending power in the world, many times larger a budget for its defense procurements. We have been warned by our own military that China's progress is stunning and at the same time reflecting upon many of the traditional problems that have caused the United States to lag behind in terms of efficient spending and global force projection, most notably a brutal military bureaucracy. Back to the Quad Alliance, let's look at the United States as it relates to China in terms of power and projection. If we were to note the areas of the Pacific where the United States enjoys a clear geostrategic and military advantage, 
it would be the vast majority of the ocean. After World War II, this blue area would have extended all the way to the perimeter of China and Southeast Asia. Because of China's increased military spending, its decision to be more global as a military power, and its claims to the South China Sea, it now enjoys something of an advantage in its own neighborhood. Without doubt, the U.S. Navy is thoroughly more impressive than the Chinese Navy. However, our Navy is dispersed all over the globe, while China's is largely concentrated in one area, giving it something of an advantage. The Quad Alliance is designed to counter China's increased presence in Southeast Asia and the South China Sea. How does one maintain an advantage when another country is growing militarily? There are options. One is to increase your own military spending. Certainly the United States could do that. However, our yawning national debt, our increased internal demands for balancing a budget make it rather difficult for the U.S. to spend any more than it currently is as it relates to China. That was our policy during the Cold War. We had a very clear idea that if we could outspend the Russians, they would eventually economically implode, which is exactly what happened. Option number two is to form an alliance, to join forces with other countries so that your collective military capabilities continue to dominate the rising power. That has been our approach with the Chinese. And the Quad Alliance is another example of U.S. alliance forming with Beijing in mind. Here you can see, again, the flags of the four Quad countries with the very clear underlying intent of countering China's influence, not only in the South China Sea, but far beyond that. By the numbers, the four Quad nations make up almost one-fourth of the world's population over one-fourth of the world's economy, and nearly half of the world's military spending. This is a powerful set of four nation-states. Recently, there was a Quad Joint Naval exercise that happened in the Indian Ocean, something that raised flags in China and led to a stern Chinese rebuke. Here we can see China's String of Pearl strategy, this is the effort by China to create ports of call all along the coastline in Southeast and South Asia, all the way to the edges of the Middle East. The Quad Joint Military activity took place in the Bay of Bengal, right at the heart of China's String of Pearls map. We were sending the message to China that we're not going to simply sit back and allow you to grow militarily, in terms of your global footprint and influence without a counter-response from Washington. Here we can see an image of Mr. Biden's White House summit with the Quad leaders, discussing overall strategy, with the underlying theme being the ability to counter Chinese influence. So what was placed on the formal agenda of the Quad summit? COVID, infrastructure development, climate change initiatives, outer space, one of our 2022 great decisions, people-to-people -people exchanges, critical tech areas where cooperation would be essential, and combating cyber security. These are all very important issues to all of the Quad Alliance members. Let's now take a look at strategic alliances. There is a nature to them. Any time that you see a military alliance, we look at the membership to get an idea of the character, the geographic location, and possibly some insights into what that alliance is designed for. There should be some common defining principles among those members that make the alliance logical and longstanding. And then finally, an underlying raison d'etre or reason for being. Why was the alliance created in the first place, and what is its mission? As we saw with ASEAN in the previous lecture, 
the raison d'etre of an alliance does change. It was created in the 1960s to counter Vietnam. It morphed into a counter-China alliance in the 1990s. NATO similarly has changed dramatically, but in its origins, the members of NATO were Western allies following World War II with a number of common domestic principles, such as commitment to democracy, promotion of human rights, and a commitment to global trade. The underlying reason, of course, for NATO was to deter the Soviet Union from invading Central or Western Europe, such that an invasion against any NATO member would be legally construed as an invasion or an attack on all NATO members. NATO is viewed as the single most impressive and successful military alliance in human history. It has lasted since its establishment in 1949. One of its members was attacked by an outside party for the first time in 2001 with the 9-11 World Trade Center and Washington, D.C. terror strikes. NATO did respond with a joint invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. That was the first time that the key operative article of NATO was employed. NATO versus the Quad Alliance. Let's do a bit of a comparison. NATO was designed for immediate survival. Draw a very clear, bright line along the eastern edge of NATO members, or in the case of Turkey and Greece, a northern bright line. The Soviets could never cross it. Containing the Soviet Union physically was the principal aim of NATO, which of course includes deterring it from attacking a NATO member. The Quad Alliance, on the other hand, is more about positioning in the long term. There is not an immediate threat to any one of the four members of the Quad Alliance. No one is gaming out a Chinese invasion of Japan or the United States because it simply is so unlikely. Countering China is the long-term plan, not containing it. Containment requires complete success at all times. Countering simply means positioning and repositioning to blunt the influence of China in its quest for global influence. With the Soviet Union, there was a very clear record of invading neighbors and establishing puppet governments. With China, however, there's no record of invasion. China's not been at war since 1979 when it briefly invaded Vietnam and was taught a stern lesson for it. No, China's historical record is one of investment and trade. That is not something that can be contained it can only be countered. Let's compare the Soviet Union, the focus of NATO, with China, which is the focus of the Quad Alliance. We should not treat them as the same. Yes, there were both communist powers at the time of their threat. The Soviet Union during the Cold War, China to this day, at least in name. They're both rising major powers. They're both land powers. Beyond that, the threat is quite different. For the Soviet Union, we never considered it to be a legitimate country. Moscow complained about this continuously during the Cold War that American diplomats and American presidents believed the Soviet Union and its Communist Party were illegitimate. We've not said that about China. Since we shifted from recognizing Taiwan, the Republic of China, to recognizing mainland China, the People's Republic of China, we've always considered it to be a legitimate power. The Soviet Union rejected American global leadership. Its military posture and spending were designed to keep it on par with the U.S. militarily and geostrategically to maintain a bipolar world and to deny the United States a claim of global leadership and hegemony. To date, the Chinese have accepted American global leadership. Part of the reason for the difference here is that the Soviets realized that the liberal international economic order, 
That is the free trade system announced in 1944 at Bretton Woods and installed globally ran counter to its economic policies, while the Chinese, especially since the death of Mao Zedong, have gotten rich on the trading system that we've established and largely underwritten. The Soviet Union died grasping its Marxist beliefs and tenets. Even Gorbachev remained a communist to the very end, whereas the Chinese have largely abandoned Marxist orthodoxy, ideology, and tenets, instead being much more practical, pragmatic, and even a global trading power. For the Soviets, when they wanted an ally in the world, there was a very clear communist ideology test. When a nation raised the Marxist-Leninist flag, it was signaling to Moscow, we want to be your ally, you are free to ship us your money and your weaponry. China, on the other hand, has no such litmus test. It doesn't matter to China if you're a capitalist or non-capitalist country, democracy or authoritarian, large or small, even location doesn't seem to matter for China. They look for things, notably economic opportunity, energy resources, and future favorable votes in international organizations, but there's no ideological litmus test for China when it seeks allies across the global system. The Soviet Union had a military-centric aid policy to allies, providing them with weaponry. For China, it is an economic-centric relationship that it establishes. The Soviets fought proxy wars with the United States in places like Korea in the 1950s, Vietnam in the 60s and 70s, and beyond, while the Chinese largely refrain from military confrontation either with the United States or with our allies. China is much more careful in its international interactions than the Soviet Union was during the Cold War. The Soviet Union was crippled by its economic and political system, while the Chinese have been propelled forward by their own. Minimal trade between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, especially before detente, Kissinger obviously changed that, seeking inroads to Moscow for purposes of pursuing arms control accords. We've had maximum trade with the Chinese. And what that means is that during the Cold War, as we confronted the Soviets, not only could we militarily spin them into the grave, we could also economically sanction them without hurting us back home. China, however, because of the volume of trade, it means sanctions tariffs, and quotas will have a very high cost for the United States. Here we can see the old Cold War map, the Soviet Union and its allies in Eastern Europe, the United States, of course, with its allies in blue on the left-hand side. If the Soviet Union crossed that line, invaded a blue region, a NATO member, the red balloon went up, as they say in the military, and the U.S. would be at war. How, however, do you draw bright lines as it relates to China and its global economic trading practices? Here you can see the Silk Road or Belt Road Initiative. It's had many different terms. And the label that China uses varies depending on the region because the translation does have different implications. But as you can see, by land and by sea, China's reaching out in the world, building infrastructure, highways, byways, rail system, seaports, airports, and in so doing, it's very difficult for the U.S. to draw a line and say, don't invest here. I mean, they've even reached Western Europe and NATO allies with Chinese investment projects. So the question is, where does one begin to counter the adversary, the rival? For the Soviet Union, it was pretty easy. It's the divide between Eastern Europe and Western Europe. But if we're going to go after them and try to undermine them, that's called a rollback policy. The question remains, where exactly do you go on the offensive? Dwight Eisenhower in the 1950s focused on Eastern Europe. 
He said to them through America's liberation policy, if you rebel, we are there with you. We will support you and stand by you. And we saw rebellions happen in Hungary in the 1950s and Czechoslovakia in the 1960s. With each of those, the United States said, we're with you verbally, but nothing more. That was the Soviet sphere of influence. We could not go across that line. Mr. Reagan in the 1980s revised the rollback policy by focusing on the weak outposts, places like Nicaragua, the Horn of Africa, and even Southeast Asia, forcing the Soviet Union to spend more of its dwindling resources protecting its outposts, as Brezhnev called them, its far-flung allies. That was a much more successful policy and a much less dangerous one than challenging the Soviets in their own backyard. With China, it's borderline impossible to find a place to counter effectively. What exactly are we going to say to countries in the Caribbean? Stop taking Chinese loans? Especially since we're not prepared to replace those Chinese loans. Don't misunderstand me. Many, if not most, of the countries that borrow money from China grow to regret it. They realize the terms are not that favorable. The infrastructure project doesn't pay the dividends that they had anticipated, but by then it is too late. And as noted earlier, now China is even reaching into the European Union and NATO for its investment projects. It's just a very different rival for us to counter than was the Soviet Union during the Cold War era. It's a deal that's too good to turn down, and very few countries do turn it down. So the Quad Alliance, in many ways, is a default strategy. We cannot head off Chinese investments abroad, even in our allied regions of Europe, so let's form a geostrategic alliance that boxes China in militarily. Here we can see an image of the Quad Alliance meeting. This is actually a portion of the alliance because the United Kingdom is not a member. It is Mr. Biden on the right and the Australian head of government in the center, and they are announcing a new nuclear submarine deal. This made headlines across the globe, but especially in France, because France had an existing multi-billion dollar deal with Australia for diesel-powered submarines. That was ditched in favor of the more obviously impressive one offered by the U.S. and the United Kingdom. This tells us that the U.S. is beginning to prioritize the Quad Alliance over individual bilateral relations, even with NATO allies. How about this pivot that's happening to Asia? This is certainly a major force that's led to the Quad Alliance. The question is why? Why are we going to the eastern portion of Asia in particular? Well, there are some obvious reasons. The new center of power is there. China is an emerging global power. It's located in Asia. Let's focus our attention there. Shifting away from the modest policies of trying to rebuild nations like Iraq, Libya, and Afghanistan, and instead focusing upon big picture issues, like who is the dominant power in the world, and how can we learn to live with and work with the Chinese. Our failures in Central and Western Asia, we've been burned very badly in the Middle East in particular, and the edges of that region, we should try a different area of the world. And finally, the economic opportunity that is there. There are some significant and growing economies in Asia, China, India, Indonesia, Japan, South Korea, it's logical from an economic point of view to spend our foreign policy energy working on policies oriented towards the Pacific and the Asian continent. And I don't mean all of Asia, of course, when I talk about the pivot there. Asia is a very large and diverse continent, many countries, very large portion of the global population, as we saw in an earlier lecture in this series. There is the portion of Asia that's part of the Middle East, ranging from Turkey to Iran and the Arabian Peninsula. There is South Asia, which is dominated by India and Pakistan. 
There is Central Asia, which is the, the stands of the world. There is Southeast Asia, which we looked at recently. When we talk about the pivot to Asia, we probably draw the line about here. India and China toward, to the east, including Southeast Asia and the Pacific Rim. That's where the power, population, military spending, and economies can be found. Nearly half of the world's population resides in that part of Asia to the right of this yellow line. All right, we've taken a look now at the three considerations. Let's consider U.S. foreign policy. Strategies to deal with China range on the spectrum from a soft line to a hard line approach. Playing the long game is the soft line. This means a lot of confidence that in the end we're better off than China and we will prevail as the rules are currently written and as the global system is arranged. The hardline side, we have the neoconservative or neocon strategy. The long game, priority on trade and profit with the underlying assumption that as the Chinese become wealthier and more invested, they'll be less likely to challenge the US as the top country in the geostrategic pyramid. It makes a lot of sense because the wealthier you are and the more you trade, especially with other rivals, the higher the cost of military engagement with them. The neoconservative strategy is very different. It begins with the premise that the US is the dominant geostrategic, military, political, economic power of the world and any nation state, communist or non, ally or enemy, long history or short one, any country that's rising is a threat to the United States and must be dealt with immediately. We often associate the neocon strategy with Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as Libya under the Obama administration. Most of the neocons, of course, were found in the George W. Bush administration. And that was a strategy of toppling dictators and promoting democracy. That's a different part of the neocon strategy. The traditional approach is to tamp down on any rising power, and that would mean confrontation with China. There are, of course, plenty of options in between, including a counterbalancing strategy, which is what we see with the Quad Alliance. Why it makes sense. If the U.S. seeks to separate from China, finding key allies around China makes a lot of sense. It's logical. Creating an alliance with these four countries passes the eyeball test as we look at a map of Asia and the Pacific. Disentangling our trade and supply chain lines requires finding new allies in that region where labor is competitive and we can find other sources of many of the products that we consume as a nation. And then finally, add both South Korea and Vietnam to the Quad Alliance. There have been some talk of this, maybe as associate members, if not full members of the Quad Alliance. If you were to ask me which of these two countries impresses me most today and into the future, Without hesitation, I'm going to say the United States. This is the global power of the 21st century. We are hampered largely by internal variables. We're shooting ourselves in the foot politically. We have two political parties that are borderline dysfunctional. A democratic party that is so diverse, that is so divided, it has a hard time unifying and a Republican Party that is loyal to one personality. These are not healthy trends on either side of the political line, but they're manageable if the two parties could work together. But as you will note in 2022, there's virtually no bipartisan agreement in Washington, D.C., and that means it's very difficult for the United States to move forward in the most optimal fashion. China's advantage domestically it is a dictatorship. One voice makes a decision for all, but there are so many deficits in China, geographically, geostrategically, and demographically. Those three key variables that we use to project 
where a country will be in 30, 50, or 80 years, they're not very positive for China. And as it continues to reach out into the world, there will be natural counterbalances against it, not just the Quad Alliance, but by local and regional powers, there will be a resistance movement emerging against China in those areas. So if I'm going to place a bet on which country does best this century, no doubt it's the United States. Thank you for attending this lecture. Do stay engaged and make great decisions. Well, that was um, quite an overview, and I am just delighted to, to have Dr. Carol Evans here with us to make some sense of what, of what we've heard. Dr. Carol Evans uh, became the director of the Strategic Studies Institute at the US AWC Press at the US Army War College in May of 2020. Before becoming the director of SSI, she was a research professor of national security at the War College. Now, before she joined the U.S. Army War College, Dr. Evans was a senior program manager, National Security Global Business Division with Battelle Memorial Institute. She brings 30 years of expertise in the areas of mission assurance, asymmetric warfare, terrorism, maritime security, and homeland security. Now, I can tell you there's a whole lot more to her bio. We would be here all night, but she has served as an advisor to the Director of Central Intelligence, a technical advisor to the National Ground Intelligence Center, Department of the Army, and an advisor to the Defense Science Board, Office of the Secretary of Defense. Need I give any more <laughs> expertise uh, credentials to Dr. Carol Evans? Dr. Carol Evans, we're delighted to have you join us. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you so very much. And so for some of you might not be familiar. So I, as, as director of the Strategic Studies Institute at the US Army War College. So basically I am leading the Army's premier think tank. So, you know, we're talking about, you know, Ukraine or we're talking about how do we apply, you know, land power in the Indo-Pacific. So one of the key projects that I have ongoing this year, and one that I'm currently writing on, it's very near and dear to my heart, is the Quad Project. And I'm about to have a major workshop where I'm bringing in all of the, you know, some fantastic experts from all of the Quad partners. So obviously, you know, Japan, United States, you know, India, um, and Australia. And we're gonna be meeting at the US Army War College and talking about the future of the quad. So one of the things when I got this opportunity, I was really excited by this because um, about two or three weeks ago, I actually did a great decisions talk um, over an hour um, for AHEC. And you can, you, I, I, um, Joyce will be able to give you that link to it. And I, I say this because not to blow my own horn, but I have to say with all due respect, this particular presentation on the quad left me really, really lacking as you as an audience. Because you know, when I really listened as I just did to the video, I think I maybe got two minutes of who is the quad? You saw flags, but the countries, why are they motivated to be part of the quad? And the, it, the quad should be, it is the quadrilateral security dialogue. It was established in 2004 as part of these four countries coming together to offer assistance during the uh, tsunami, that, that massive tsunami that hit Southeast Asia. And out of those initial relationships in 2007 at the behest of Japan, who was one of the major you know, leaders in providing that humanitarian assistance, uh, then the prime minister of Japan, Shinzo Abe, said, you know, we have, we are all maritime countries. And, and you saw that, you know, yes, the US Navy has a big presence there, but we are all, India has a massive maritime, Australia, we are maritime, but we're also democracies. And, and right away, that quad, the quadrilateral security dialogue was, was created to create what we call a free and open Indo-Pacific. 
And so I really, you know, my disappointment for you viewers, you in the audience, you're not getting a flavor of why was the quad created? Who are the quad members? The, the, um, the person that did this video simply went off target and started talking about, you know, strategic alliances, um, comparing apples and oranges with the USSR and China, different timeframes. What we really need to do is a deep dive for you in understanding from a quad perspective, this is a relationship that is on again, off again. So while the quad was created in 2007, Australia was punished by China um, in 2008 and withdrew. Australia heavily dependent on its trade relationship with China. China exerted immense coercion against many imports that it receives from Australia and Australia bowed out. And so we're only left with three members. And during that time, we really haven't had a resurgence back into the quad until about 2019, 2020. So the presenter gave you a very static image of the quad as if it's simply been ongoing all this time. It hasn't. It has gotten a boost only very recently at the tail end of the Trump administration and an acceleration through the Biden administration. I'm not you know, criticizing administrations, please. But I'm saying that that deliberate emphasis on the utility of the quad from the United States is something fairly recent. But in order to understand its future utility for the United States, we cannot assume that all of the quad countries have the same set of interests in that relationship. And in fact, the talk that I gave for the great decisions really peels back that you know, if you look at Japan, who is the originator of the Quad, you look at Australia, who's really become very recently engaged, you look at the United States, steadfast partner, you look at India, on again, off again, they each have very different views of the Quad. And that's going to provide some tensions in terms of the Quad's effectiveness. The person, and let me just sort of take a pause. The person provided you then from a US policy mechanism, let's make it a mini NATO. Let's make it a NATO in order to contain and deter China. Well, we're gonna say right now, yeah, I would say that might've been a little bit, particularly from the Trump administration, but there's a recognition now, particularly especially in the Biden administration, that these partners in the quad have very different views, different goals. What are they based on? Their own national security interests. Japan? a balancing act, a hedge with China. And remember, Japan is contained by its ability to really be more expeditionary and to, and to really go after the China threat. So it's being able to use the quad in a way to justify in terms of domestic politics, increasing, it's almost doubled its defense expenditure as a pacifist country. And then if you look at Australia, you know, Australia's in a unique geographic, geostrategic position. And we talked in a related AUKUS, that major deal between the United States, UK, and Australia in terms of providing submarine technology. But the United States were thinking ahead and like, oh, a basing agreement. This goes beyond the quad. And Australia understands that. And for Australia, again, because the incredible dependency it's had on Australian trade, it needs like the UK who's been out of Brexit, right? So that UK, Australia trade is an important aspect. The UK, sorry, US and Australia trade. There are many factors at play. And the way, again, this, this characterization, you, you didn't get this in-depth analysis. Let me turn very quickly to India. India, I think, is actually the central driver of the quad mechanism. And I think where the quad goes, India goes. And I say this because, to me, India is the countervailing power against China. We can't be everywhere in the Indo-Pacific. And the person that led you through the quad took a very East Asia, Southeast Asia. When you looked at the map, you didn't come around the coast of India. 
India's interests, when we talk about the Indo-Pacific, their interests go from uh, you know, Sri Lanka all the way to Djibouti and up to the Red Sea. And they're a key player because most of our US naval forces and, and you know, Army Air Force, we're based in East Asia. So the ability that India can give us extra capabilities because that region of the Indo-Pacific is spread so thinly. So India is a very key strategic player. I was also struck by a number of inaccuracies in the video, and I have to call them out because I, I can't just stand here and go, you know. One was, you know, uh, I think the, the um, speaker said something about, well, you know, within the Quad, there's never been a serious threat to any of the Quad members. And I was shaking my head going like, India has fought a major war in 1961. It has ongoing skirmishes in it, and it had a major um, you know, combat issue on the line of actual control starting in 2020. So for India, China is a huge strategic threat. And we, United States, are helping them through intelligence, military supplies, everything to build that capacity. So we are really looking at that strategic relationship with India and the Quad as a vehicle to help us support that. Japan, key bilateral relationship. You know, we have the seventh fleet based in Japan. Japan is now coming out to, you know, think about how we can support a possible Chinese invasion against Taiwan. So these are really complex relationships, none of which were discussed in the presentation you received today, sadly. Um, so I'm looking forward to um, questions, uh, discussion, but I just uh, needed to share with you that the quadrilateral dialogue, you have to think about you know, its foundation, the vying domestic and national security issues that each of these countries are thinking about as we engage with each other. Um, there's been strong, strong and increased collaboration between the Quad, but it's fragile, it's delicate. And then what is its future? And one of the things when we talk about the future is perhaps it bringing in two key European allies. This is in the, you know, just in discussion, but the UK has just deployed its um, Queen Elizabeth Carrier Strike Battle Group. It was her maiden voyage. And where did she go? She went into the Indo-Pacific. Um, France is the largest Indo-Pacific regional partner. It, it is the only person that maintains both a uh, capacity in the, in the Indo, in the Indian Ocean, full-time, as well as in the Pacific. We don't. So, and it has, you know, populations spreading across uh, that and is, and is regularly and routinely deployed. So I, you know, hope that I can provide a more uh, rich and substantive view of the quadrilateral dialogue and its importance, because yes, it is absolutely a foreign policy tool that we need to use not only to bolster um, the capacity of those three other partners in order for us, it's not just deterrence, but it's also containing and competing. And I'm gonna <coughs> cough in. All right, if you need to get some water, that, that's okay too. I will say that um, you have certainly shed a lot of light on this um, to, to, to help us to understand that it's, it's a fragile alliance. It's not something that's just solid and that it may splinter unless, but, but I guess the question I have, especially because I participated in a book study er, a little bit earlier with, I don't know if you know, Chandran uh, Nair, who's written yes. about dismantling global white privilege. And it's got in my mind that why do we perceive are we wrong to perceive China as such a threat simply because it wants to be a, a, an economic and whatever powerhouse? Even in the video, it was China was really portrayed as um, someone who is it was using its power in the economic arena, in the business arena, in the investment arena, which seems to me to be well. Why should we think no one else should come and compete with us? Why is that such a big threat? So. Since you have this big picture, militarily and otherwise, are we right to be afraid of an emerging China? We, we absolutely are. I mean, China's 
the Belt and Road Initiative, you know, there are two parts to it. One is the overland route that they want to connect the Western part of China into Europe. Those are digital networks, railway, high-speed transit. And then the other one is the, what we call the Maritime Silk Road. And sometimes you saw that map of the, um, the Silk Road, the, the string of pearls, right? What China is doing is it's using, there's a great game in China called the game of Go. It's most like chess. They're very strategic. So China is using its state owned companies as well as private owned companies to create basing and logistics facilities all the way from all across the Indo-Pacific into the Red Sea and even into Europe. Now there are two ways they're doing this. One is through foreign ownership of ports or leasing agreements or port operations. So right now, like within the Mediterranean, all the way into you know, Europe, Italy, China controls roughly 32% of European ports. Hmm. And when you talk about China now making investments under the Belt and Road, under that Silk Maritime Road, into Sri Lanka, right off the coast of India, into Gwadar in Pakistan, Colombia, where its nuclear sub, its submarines, not its submarines have docked. It, it is going to use and bases now into Djibouti on the Horn of Africa. China knows its vulnerability from the United States and its allies is along what we call these sea lines of communication. And these, these are transit straits where all of its shipping for energy, raw materials, and trade must pass. And so it's trying to create an architecture, a security architecture, that it can control and countermand the United States, particularly its Navy and allied forces, from controlling. Because if we go to war with China, what are we going to do? We're going to lock down their trade. We're going to lock down their energy, just as we did with Japan. They've learned the lessons learned. So <clears throat> we're going to block, they blockade them into where they control within the South China Sea. But none of that trade energy can transit. So one of the reasons why they're expanding expeditionally is to create and confront the United States and its allies and, and control their own, what we call the sea lines of control, of, of communication. For example, they're building a digital network. It's called the Peace Network. The peace network is going from Xishang in Western China, down through Pakistan, out through Gwadar, tunneling through the ocean, and it, where is it popping up? In Marseille, ah. France. And it's a dedicated you know, business line where they can tap, they can use submarine capabilities, they can do all sorts of things in order to monitor that kind of traffic straight into the EU. So the Chinese are, you know, Huawei, I, I can go on and on and on. The Chinese are very strategic and we have been late to the table in trying to look at methods to compete against them. And particularly on the geo-economic front. We have thought more on the military front. Mm. We haven't really understood the nature of the Belt and Road investments because that requires more of a whole of investment government. It requires military, it requires Department of State, commerce, you name it, treasury, along with our allies in order to provide a counter to that cheap, easy money um, that, that China has been provided. So let me go to some of the questions here. I'd love to come back because I, in my mind is, but, but are we still, I'm, I'm trying to think the best, you know, that it may not be nefarious. They just want a better life and then they want to be a player in the economic arena. And it's not necessarily that they want to wipe us out, so to speak, but we'll come back to that. Um, there's a question here that says, contained though it may be in the South China Sea, China is forming naval bases far from home. Does that change the equation for the, for the Quad Alliance or for the United States? It absolutely does. I mean, if anyone's been reading the news in the last two weeks, uh, China, through again, Belt and Road Initiatives, has secured 
<clears throat> a, a nebulous security agreement with the Solomon Islands. The Solomon Islands is very close to Australia. This is, you know, for the quad, bing, 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 bing. Like you're in, Australia used to think, well, we're, we're further down under, right? We're now <laughs> for the Solomons, they're, they're right there. And uh, so it's been a wake up call for all of us. We, we are scrambling now to reopen a US embassy on the Solomon Islands. So again, the, 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 the Chinese have played us, I talk about that game of goat, it's a game of strategy and they know how to play this well. We um, first underestimated Chinese capacity. We just thought it was pure economics. And now we're fully realizing the geoeconomic, military, national security, their ability to think, to provide an alternative worldview. And I, I think mm -hmm. um, they've been actually quite brilliant at this. And we have a huge challenge ahead of us and we cannot do it alone. And so hence the quad is, is one important vehicle among others. Got it. Uh, Ella is asking, does the Quad Alliance as a security alliance have something akin to NATO's Article 5? No. Whereby an attack, okay, no. No, no, and, and, and India, that's why I said it's really important. You need to understand the view of the Quad from the individual members. Uh, none of the Quad members wants, except for the United States, want to securitize the Quad into a NATO kind of alliance. Um, India, because of her non-aligned status, her policy of strategic autonomy, uh, Prime Minister Modi has to balance this relationship both with the United States and with Russia. And he's being condemned, right? You know, yeah. India's been condemned for not speaking on, on the Ukraine. And, you know, we, United States, have been very careful not to speak out against India because we view that relationship within the Quad as really important and as well as our bilateral military relationship. So we're, we're, there's a lot of delicate tight ropes here. And that's why I said, I'm sort of disappointed with the video. It's right. not going into this kind of depth you need to know. Um, India's, a, as I said, very key strategic partner. So. Right. Well, here's another one. It sounds like ec China's economic might can punish any member of the Quad, with the arguable exception of, of course, US, the United States. We're not really a member of the Quad, though, really. Uh, would the tension be- We are a major member of the Quad. All right, so we are, we are an anchor of the Quad, all right? In fact, we, we are the anchor. And, and you know, I would like us like a wheel. Mm -hmm. We are at the center and there's spokes. And, and one of the things the Biden administration is trying to do is we've always been that in the center and all of the relationships have been out from the United States. What the Biden administration is trying to do now, and you, you saw that with that larger um, you know, to climate change and cybersecurity and um, infrastructure, Biden administration is trying to get more communication within the quad members, not relying us for that central spoke the hub, We're, we've been the hub. So how do we get more of the quad members working together is, is been one of his issues. No, the United States has been absolutely central. It, it, we, we are, okay. and, and you look at it just also through our, our you know, military uh, um, aid, cooperation, co-production, like AUKUS that was mentioned, mm -hmm. US, UK, Australia providing nuclear submarine technology. This is huge for the Australians. We, we do not have enough assets. The United States, again, inaccuracy. China is the world's largest Navy. In that video, it said we were like the dominant force. We're not naval-wise. They outstrip us. Wow. So giving that kind of capability to the Australians, whether you can monitor some of those straits and uh, attack uh, Chinese assets is huge. So. We're, we're doing a huge amount. We are providing um, the Poseidon aircraft to India, which is a maritime domain awareness asset, but it's also a submarine you know, hunter asset for, because the Chinese are building out all, they will have more submarines than we do very, very shortly. So 
we're doing a lot in terms of building up this capacity building for the core. But what about the issue of China's economic might? That that basically they can wipe out any of them with their economic way. They can force them to, as it did with, as you mentioned with Australia. What if it uses that? Would that be the fatal blow? No. So what we're doing is we're creating um, bilateral economic relations, and we're creating um, more creative supply chain dependency relationships. So number one, diversifying Australia's dependence on China, creating other markets for Chinese minerals, agriculture, wine, langoustines, uh, their exports. So that, that's part of what the Quad is doing. India is a, is a very big economic powerhouse in its own right. And it, it, it cannot be simply, uh, you know, um, under Chinese thumb. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and Japan, again, has already been about, you know, once the economic recession hit, earlier on, diversifying its supply chains, particularly for semiconductors, um, into Vietnam, into back into the United States, and also into Taiwan. So there's been a massive effort among the Quad members deliberately to disengage from the Chinese economy and create greater redundancy. So we have another, well, we talked a little bit about this, but still I'd like you maybe to go into it a little more. It's, it's about the, the Belt and Road Initiative stretching into Europe and Africa and the Middle East. So how relevant is that to the Quad, you know, to the Quad, you know? It's or how relevant is the Quad to basically countering that Belt and Road Initiative? It is within the Indo-Pacific, right? You know, when we're talking about into uh, parts of Africa, um, Certainly, you know, Kenya, Red Sea, Sudan, all along the Red Sea, really important, um, Djibouti. Uh, when we're looking at into Pakistan, particularly what we call CPEC, the Chinese-Pakistan Economic Corridor. That is an amazing, you know, gazillion billion dollar um, effort by China and Pakistan to avoid China taking its oil supply through the Straits of Malacca where it's vulnerable. So for people that have a geography sense, if you, you know, come out of the Straits of Hormuz, what China wants to do is dump roughly maybe 40% of its oil into Gwadar, Pakistan with pipelines that will then go overland into the Western part of China so that they don't have to transit the oil through the Straits of Malacca or Lombok or the Sunda Straits. And this is a way of gaining um, a, a little bit more energy independence. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, again, it, hugely strategic, but what we're trying to do, you know, encountering BRI is we've had at least a decade of BRI investments and many countries, particularly you've, you've seen in the news, Sri Lanka, riots, right? Mm. Uh, Pakistan, billions of dollars in debt, can't repay their World Bank loans, all because of these, Chinese BRI investments. And so many of the countries have had a wake up call and realizing now that there are vulnerabilities with the BRI. And we are, again, I said very late to the game. I was writing about this six years ago. We needed our act together. Um, United States, India, and um, Japan have created what we call the blue dot network which is transparent economic financing for infrastructure projects. Australia has um, what's called Step Up in the Pacific to try and provide more economic assistance infrastructure development for its Pacific Islanders. Um, India has Look East. It has many different engagements within the region. And this is, again, it's, I think where we benefit from our partners within the Quad because we can't be everywhere at once. Um, but we can certainly support the efforts of these crucial allies and their work in terms of countering BRI. Right. Well, we're approaching the end of our time, but let me throw this one at you. We have, we still have a few questions, but this one seems most interesting. It's because we're all worried now about war, right? <laughs> Since yeah. we're in a war world, right? But it says the US and China are entangled economically, but that interdependency won't necessarily keep the two from going to war 
And the question is, will it? I do not see, I, well, let me back up. You, you know, the, the, everyone thinks about, and everyone's looking right now and drawing the analysis between uh, Russia in Ukraine yeah. and China in Taiwan. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I could absolutely say, you know, uh, from the US Army perspective, you know, that's one of our worst nightmares. You know, how, well, across the DOD um, enterprise and, and China has spoken out more recently in terms of we will, you know, Taiwan is a part of us and Taiwan has talked about um, how, how do they repel such an amphibious kind of assault um, and what, and, and we, we are in the midst of, um, you know, what I can say on the unclass level, you know, war games, you know, trying to map out what that looks like. Um, understanding Chinese capabilities, our capabilities with our allies and partners, it's going to have to be an allied uh, response. Of course, the most important part for us is just as deterrence failed in the Ukraine arena, right? Here we have the strongest alliance, NATO. Did deterrence work? No. And so we're looking inside ourselves to go, what does deterrence for the United States with our key allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific looks like to counter a Chinese invasion. And that's something we're grappling with. And I'll, I'll leave it you know, there. Um, it's something we're grappling with. And I would say you should be grappling away because <laughs> I, right. I mean, right now, I, I think for people who are watching the world, Everything seems to be on the table. The, the threats are very, very real. We, we can't dismiss any of them, it seems. Um, but let, this will be the last one. I promise you've been most gracious, but this one is a little bit of an intriguing question. Uh, they ask, can the Quad stop Chinese oil imports via ocean sufficiently if they needed to, to cripple the country? Or is Russia the lifeline that China needs? Uh Yes, we could cripple today Chinese imports of oil. Now, Russia, China is an overland, right, capability. Right. Do we have the capability to cripple that? Yes, we do. So we're good. We're good to contain them if we need to. Uh, yeah, we, we, have that, we have that capability. We have those targets. Very good. Well, this has been as as one as Ella said as she had to leave off a little bit, but this is a most enlightening conversation, uh, and you have done a uh, yeoman's job to really make some sense out of such a complex uh, set of issues with with the Quad Alliance. I want to thank you, and I want to share with our audience that I approached Dr. Carol Evans quite late to ask her. We had someone with the U.S. Institute of Peace slated; they fell out uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, but she was so gracious in responding and saying, yes, she would come to join us. And I think this was an act of God. You did a wonderful, yeah. wonderful job. No, I, I mean, no, I'm passionate about this. You know, I, I'm passionate about many subjects. And again, uh, Joyce, please use me as a resource for your members. Um, this, is, this is only one, you know, I, I have to cross the entire threat spectrum of, yeah. of the army. So Anything I can do to support your organization, I look forward to being a member uh, and being more active. I really, you know, use me as an asset. Well, thank you. Thank we you everyone for participating and asking such great questions. Absolutely. Well, it's our, our viewers. And, and again, thanks to the Fredrickson Library. They are watching, you know, even in sometimes as a group here. But we thank you and thank you, Jessica for uh, your support of this. And we will definitely be uh, connecting with Dr. Carol Evans and perhaps asking her to be a keynote for one of our upcoming events because she has a lot of expertise to share about issues that are vitally important for our nation and for us as individual Americans. So with that, I wanna thank you for your service, Dr. Carol Evans and good night, everyone. This concludes our 2022 Great Decisions Discussion Series but we will be back with other scintillating topics very soon. Thank you all now. Good Thank night. You. Good night.